this is a story about saying yes. Yes to whatever comes. Being willing to be our commitment, even in the face of tremendous adversity. Seeing the gap, making ourselves fit no matter the cost. When the call came to remove over 350 animals from the Juan Rivera National Zoo in Puerto Rico, we knew we simply had to go. When you look at these beautiful creatures, it's impossible not to be moved. Such magnificence, such splendor, each one a unique testimony to Mother Nature's creative genius, expression, each shape, each form, each color perfect, innocent, yet trapped behind bars for the entertainment of others who've long since disappeared, caged in spaces not of their choosing, starving, hoping for life in a room with little hope. These aren't the type of animals the sanctuary is known for rescuing. Not anything we've really prepared for. A monumental task, an impossible task. A call that could have easily been ignored. Yet this entire organization, the people, the thousands of supporters, the movement has been built on decades of doing exactly this. Seeing the need, seeing our place to help and then diving in and doing what we know we must do because it's what we were put on this earth to do. And so we went. This was a place of tremendous meaning for so many people. For thousands of Puerto Ricans, this zoo held a special place in their hearts. Each winding path, each corridor, each small enclosure held so much more than an animal. It represented the idyllic and safe space of childhood memories, where exotic animals took a prominent place in their past. Yet the zoo was not without its dark corners and secrets. For many years, mismanagement and misallocation of funds had cut corners that directly impacted the care of the animals it housed. What had once been a shining jewel of the island had become run down and poorly cared for. More and more animal welfare activists raised the alarm that something needed to be done to care for the hundreds of animals caged at the zoo. Well, then came the hurricanes, two major ones in a single year. The first causing significant damage, the second devastating the small island, leveling buildings, destroying infrastructure, chaos at every level for the small tropical paradise. Nearly every house was damaged in some way, many beyond repair. People's livelihoods, their homes, their future hung in the balance in the wake of the destructive storm. What remained was an economy and a people fighting for their own lives, struggling to hold things together. The Puerto Rico National Zoo was heavily damaged as well, needing millions of dollars in repairs. And in light of this, the U.S. government made the controversial decision to close the zoo, at first temporarily, and then, as time went on, permanently. For over six years, the zoo remained closed to the public, with only a skeleton crew of zoo employees to care for the animals. The hurricanes had knocked out power to the zoo, and the workers tried to keep things operating with small generators that failed one by one. Soon, the zoo was reclaimed by nature, became overgrown with vegetation, Fences damaged, handrails and exhibits sagging. Animals in cages sweltered in the stifling heat with no fans to cool their concrete homes. Yet many in the community responded with tremendous fervor, requesting that the animals stay on the island. There was one animal in particular that captured everyone's attention. Mundi, the enormous elephant. She was the symbol of the zoo the animal that everyone who visited as a child remembered. People believed that as long as Mundi remained on the island, the zoo would stay in Puerto Rico. And so some in the community rallied around keeping Mundi in place, doing whatever they could to stall or halt the rescue. Organizing huge protests on social media, 
plastering the outer walls of the zoo with signs decrying the rescuers. Some even broke into the compound and were arrested for trespassing, doing whatever they could to slow or hamper the progress being made. Yet not everyone on the island thought keeping the zoo open in Puerto Rico was a good idea. Animal lovers and welfare agencies in the community recognized the pain each animal was experiencing and demonstrated their support of the sanctuary and its mission to save each precious life. This was always going to be a tricky political situation, but it also had to be done very quickly. Time was of the utmost importance. Animals were dying almost daily. And so once it was decided the Puerto Rico Zoo was going to be closed and the animals were going to be removed, the wild animal sanctuary sprang into action as quickly as possible. As one of the world's premier animal rescue organizations, the Wild Animal Sanctuary has a reputation for accomplishing massively complex rescues, many times inside of a highly intricate and sensitive environment. The sanctuary has rescued animals from around the globe and made a name for itself by successfully rehousing hundreds of animals made famous in Netflix's Tiger King series. But sometimes being known for what we do is challenging. The successes of the past sets a new standard, giving us the opportunity to take on even greater things in the face of even greater challenges. Relocating 700 animals from the Juan Rivera Zoo in Puerto Rico, locating homes for these dozens of different species with other sanctuaries and refuges would be a monumental challenge. And many times throughout the rescue, homes were secured right as they were needed, with not a moment to spare. Initially, a team of veterinarians and sanctuary medical specialists traveled to Puerto Rico to inspect and test the animals, getting accurate data on which animal was able to travel. What they saw was overwhelming. Animals in horrible health, some unable to walk, many malnourished, unable to stand, unable to eat, dying. As veterinarians went throughout the island, stabilizing those that could be saved, it was clear this was going to be a massive, massive task. The sanctuary staff began coordinating the rescue with other sanctuaries, the Justice Department, and the Puerto Rican government. A massive airlift would require gigantic planes capable of transporting larger animals like the elephant, hippos, and rhino. This was certainly the largest and most complex rescue the sanctuary had ever taken, and was very likely the largest overseas animal rescue in history. Finally, the day came when the first of the animals was set to be rescued. Mara, a beloved chimpanzee, was the first to go. Her iconic role at the zoo had captured the attention of the community. And when the truck headed out to the airport with Mara on board, there were hundreds of protesters at the zoo's entrance. Even though the plan had been to move Mara in secret, leaks on social media outlets had resulted in a very dangerous and tense situation, with cars carrying protesters weaving in and out of the motorcade. Luckily, Mara made it to the airport safely and was soon flown off the island. From then on, there was a constant police presence at the zoo and during the transport of subsequent animals to the airport. And so the sanctuary began working through the zoo, systematically rescuing animals, placing them in special transport crates before transitioning them to the airport. Multiple species-specific professionals and veterinarians were on hand to help transport the animals, each one well acquainted with every animal's needs ensuring their safety all the way to their new home. The second major airlift was to transport the African lions, two black bears, as well as the Sani, the female dromedary camel. Each species comes with its own challenges, yet the years of experience and ingenuity of sanctuary personnel got the job done. Rescuing lions is what the sanctuary does best, and yet the conditions added to the difficulty. Each group of lions was kept in individual exhibits connected by long concrete runs to a central lion house made of concrete and steel. 
The fans had long since stopped running, so the rescuer sweltered in the sweat box, trying to entice each lion to enter the transport cage. With such overwhelming heat, none of the animals were cooperating, so ultimately the decision was made to gently sedate and create the lions to avoid them overheating. It also gave the rescuers an opportunity to provide medication and to do veterinary checks on the lions before transporting them. Dasani was next. She'd been moved to her stall in the large barn. On the morning of the rescue, a special crate was placed right outside her stall, and the rescuers tried to entice her in. She wasn't having it at all. Well, at least until a bucket of carrots was produced. Within minutes, Dasani was on her way, happily munching on her goodies. Next was Mikey, the feeble old black bear that was nearly blind. His cage was deep down the jungle, separated a bit from the main zoo. Mikey couldn't see, but luckily he still had his sense of taste. The sugary syrup and gummy worms were exactly what was needed to entice him to start his journey. As the animals were rescued and the crates were loaded, additional trucks were entering the compound, carrying massive crates for the mega vertebrae. The hippos, rhino, and of course, Mundi the elephant. Gigantic cranes were used to sling the crates into position, and from then on, all of the larger animals would be fed exclusively in their crates to help them grow accustomed. With the lions, the camel, the two bears, and a few smaller animals loaded, the rescuers again headed to the airport. Protesters were lined up outside the gate, yet this time over 20 police officers on motorcycles cleared the way leapfrogging ahead of the speeding motorcade to close intersections and to block on-ramps to the highway, ensuring the safe passage of the animals and rescuers to the airport. Soon, all the animals were on board and headed to the Wild Animal Sanctuary in Colorado. When they arrived, they were placed in small temporary enclosures where they would receive medical treatment and be given time to acclimate to their new environment before being released into larger habitats that would soon become their forever home. For many months, the sanctuary continued rescuing animals from the zoo. Luckily, the sanctuary wasn't entirely alone in this effort. Multiple rescue agencies, animal specialists, shipping and logistics coordinators partnered together to create a coalition focused on the safe transport of these animals from the Puerto Rico Zoo. Yet through it all, the sanctuary bore the brunt of the effort and all of the expense. For several weeks, the rescuers prepared to move the most challenging and largest animals. The stakes were incredibly high. Each of the massive creatures needed to be enticed into their crates the day of the rescue. They were too big to be moved any other way. If they didn't go, the rescue would fail. There was a massive and very expensive cargo plane chartered to leave Puerto Rico early the next morning. It would leave with or without the animals. There'd simply be no second chance. On May 12, 2023, the zoo was overrun by security teams, and a select group of vetted journalists were allowed on the compound. Everyone was on edge. The zoo was filled with activity and bustle, with heavy equipment preparing crates and trucks for transportation. Everywhere, that is, except for Monday's compound. You see, elephants are smart. Like, really smart. They have incredible hearing, and Mundy, well, she was a very social elephant. She loved connecting with humans and interacting with the rescue workers. Weeks earlier, her crate had been placed at the main entrance of her enclosure, and for several days, the elephant expert Carol Buckley had spent significant time getting to know Mundy, earning her trust and preparing her to step inside the crate for her journey. For several days, Mundy comfortably entered the crate again and again with no fear, eating directly from Carol's hand. Everything looked like it was going to go smoothly the day of the rescue. Protesters became more and more desperate to keep Mundy from leaving the island. They declared on social media, we have to scare Mundy so she won't enter the crate. They proposed banging on pots and pans from the road to impact her nerves. Several drones were flown into Mundy's area of the zoo, terrifying her. And one night, as Mundy was standing in her crate, 
someone snuck in and shot her in the back with a large pellet gun or rubber bullet. Mundy's nerves were frayed. She didn't trust the crate. She didn't trust Carol. And she wasn't excited about going anywhere. So in the early morning hours, the entire area of the zoo around Mundy's compound was blocked off. No one outside of the small rescue team was allowed in the area, since Mundy could easily hear any disturbance from a great distance. As Carol worked throughout the day with Mundy, other teams of rescuers began preparing to capture the hippos and rhino in their crates. The hippos had been closed in their feeding area, and two custom-made crates were placed end-to-end in the muddy yard, so that when they left, they'd have to exit through the crates. The far end of the crates were open so they could see daylight. A sanctuary rescue worker climbed on top of the crates, ready to drop heavy steel bars into place once the hippos were in the crates, hoping they'd hold until the permanent crate doors were closed. Reporters and onlookers surrounded the hippo compound, and then the gate was opened. After a few moments of hesitation, first one, and then the second hippo climbed into the crates, and within moments, they were secured. The crates were then lifted out of the compound to be loaded on the waiting trucks. Felipe was next, the gentle and giant rhino. He'd grown very fond of his crate, and not only entered it to eat the food that was presented there, but actually spent most of his day hanging out in the shade. Getting him in would be no problem. Getting the crate secured, however, would be much more of a challenge. Rhinos are strong, and Felipe had the ability to break the temporary bars that would hold him until the crate door was closed. Sanctuary personnel and veterinarians hid out of sight as one of his trusted feeders presented him with some new tasty treats. Once Felipe came inside, the team sprang into action, dropping the temporary bars into place, scrambling to get the crate door closed as Felipe struggled. And then finally, it was done. And Felipe and the hippos were parked in the shade where they were given food, continually monitored, and sprayed with cool water. Through all these hours, Carol continued working with Mundy trying to entice her into the crate. A small team of rescuers remained hidden out of sight, ready to close the massive steel gate behind her. It would take at least three strong men to move the gate, and for hours they waited, hiding, hoping Mundy would step inside. Yet the crate was emotionally tied to the intense trauma of the memory of the night she was shot in the back. Hours and hours passed. Nothing. Mundy would periodically step her feet into the crate, reaching out her long trunk for the food Carol held. Yet she'd never go any further than just putting a foot inside. She could smell the men hiding out of sight and reached her trunk around to see if she could feel them. As the day wore on, the tension heightened and Mundy could feel the emotions and stress around her. Her apprehension grew by the hour as the sun began to set. It seemed all was lost unless something happened soon. A decision was made by the world-renowned elephant veterinarian on site to give Mundy a sedative, one that wouldn't put her to sleep, but rather would just calm her nerves. The only issue was in the middle of Mundy's compound was a pond. If she stumbled in her drowsy state, she might fall in and harm herself. And so Carol turned her attention away from the crate and brought her into the giant elephant barn, working to entice Mundy into a familiar space. A few tense moments later, and Mundy was safely blocked in the barn she knew so well. The veterinarian administered the sedative, and soon a soothing calm washed over Mundy. She felt safe, warm, and at peace. Her crate was moved into place right outside the barn. And finally, after 16 long hours of effort, Mundy gently stepped inside. She was loaded onto the truck by the giant crane and began her slow journey out through the winding roads of the zoo. Hundreds of people waited by the entrance, 
In the darkness, police lights from the massive security convoy flashed out. And Monday, the hippos and the rhino exited the zoo for the very last time. Thousands of people lined the highways between the zoo and the airport, taking pictures, gathering to wish Monday well on her journey to her new home. Early the next morning, the giant cargo plane took off with a massive load of the precious animals bound for Florida. From there, Monday, the hippos and rhino were loaded into a line of waiting trucks bound for their new homes in Georgia and Texas. The relief in getting Monday and the other large animals off the island was palpable. For a moment, the rescuers were able to breathe a little more freely, but it was just a moment of relief. And the greatest number of animals still remained. Over the course of the next few months, the rescuers continued working through the zoo, preparing the animals to be transported in several additional massive airlifts. Each day brought new challenges to overcome, like the dozens of animals rescued from Lemur Island the only access to the small island was a rickety homemade raft that was pulled hand over hand with a rope tied to the shore. As the weeks passed, more and more animals were able to safely leave Puerto Rico for their new homes. To add to the complexity of the main rescue, the Puerto Rican government had also requested the sanctuary be responsible for the removal of hundreds of animals from a detention center in Kambalachi, about three hours away. Once intended as an animal rehabilitation center, the detention center had soon become a holding place for exotic animals who'd been removed from homes or suffering from disease were confiscated by authorities. Hundreds of monkeys, alligators, came in, snakes, birds, and turtles were crammed into the rusted and rotting prison and lived out the rest of their lives in dirty squalor. The conditions were horrible, and little care was given to the animals that lived and died there. Each cage was overcrowded and desperately inadequate to house the animals. As the sanctuary began the process of removing the animals, it became clear that this alone would represent a monumental and heart-rending task. Plywood boxes were opened, each containing hundreds of massive snakes intertwined and writhing like something out of a horror film. Rhesus monkeys, infected and dangerous to the rescuers, threatened the safety of everyone on the site. And then there was the pool. A small concrete child swimming pool dominated the center of the compound, its murky water obscuring what lay beneath it. As rescuers began to explore the pool to see if any animals were contained within its depths, they made the horrifying discovery that over 50 came in, called it home. They, along with many turtles, were stacked on top of one another all the way to the muddy depths. They'd been surviving by consuming the arms and legs and bodies of one another. The entire bottom of the pool was covered in more than a foot of mucky sludge, of bones and remains of those who hadn't survived. For nearly eight hours, the rescuers worked tirelessly, dredging the pool and methodically removing caiman, alligators, giant turtles from the depths. Snakes were gently entangled from the plywood boxes, and crate after crate were loaded into the trucks for transport to the main zoo. All told, over 350 animals were removed from the detention center massively increasing the number of animals the sanctuary was responsible for. Back at the zoo, the teams of rescuers systematically captured and created dozens of other species, preparing for the largest airlift yet. Emus, ostrich, parrots, Raccoons and even a lungfish were placed in custom containers designed to comfortably transport the animals to their new homes. 
vultures, storks, and dozens of other birds were captured and put in custom crates and loaded. Disease and infection for both the animals as well as the rescuers remained a constant threat, and health and safety protocols were implemented, sometimes requiring rescuers to wear hazmat suits or create bioprotection protocols. The sanctuary invented a highly ingenious series of quarantine processes in accordance to health guidelines to process the massive number of primates to ensure their cages were clean and they were cared for with the utmost love and compassion. Soon the parking lot of the zoo was covered with hundreds of crates containing over 296 animals. The spectacle of each crate lovingly loaded onto the truck brought tears to the eyes of the rescuers, as this represented the single largest number of animals rescued at one time. A powerful testimony to the love every single person involved in the rescue felt for every single being inside those crates. Soon every crate was loaded on the trucks and the convoy headed out once again, bound for the airport. Police officers again cleared the path, closing intersections and providing safe passage for the animals and rescuers to the airport. Upon arrival, forklifts transitioned the larger animals and crates to the loading dock. Employees from the shipping company, sanctuary personnel, airport personnel, and even law enforcement officers all pitched in as well carrying the smaller crates with snakes, caiman, birds, turtles, carefully across the pavement to the loading dock. The crates piled higher and higher on the loading dock, bearing tremendous witness to the monumental task that had just been accomplished, and moments later were quickly loaded into the air-conditioned plane. Over the course of the next few weeks and months, the sanctuary mopped up the final few animals left on the island. And then one day, it was all over. The rescuers boarded the last plane out of Puerto Rico, headed back home to Colorado. <laughs>